sisters god bless hope your night or day is going good everything's going well with you i'm just going to talk about this portion of scripture in daniel chapter 4 now this will be in somewhat relation to what you hear people say all the time that says god doesn't make robots you'll hear people say that god doesn't make robots he doesn't force people well this ought to be a very interesting story for those people that have that mindset it's recorded in daniel chapter 4 and it speaks about nebuchadnezzar and he had a dream that really disturbed him and he did not understand what it meant and he called daniel to himself to give the interpretation of that dream and daniel had told him that his kingdom would be stripped away from him for a time now nebuchadnezzar was a prideful arrogant king and some time had passed and he had forgotten about the dream that he had and his concerns about it. So then at Daniel chapter 4 verses 29, it talks about Nebuchadnezzar and it says this. At the end of the twelve months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spoke and he said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and there shall drive you from men, and your dwelling place shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you to eat grass as an ox, and seven times shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomever he wills. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from among men, and he did eat grass like an ox, and his body was wet with dew from heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like the bird's claws. So I'm going to go ahead and stop right there before I read a little bit more. So what we have is a picture of Nebuchadnezzar, and he's in his pride, and he's walking around his palace, and he says, as he's looking about himself, and he says, have I not built this kingdom by the might of my power and the honor of my majesty? See, everything Nebuchadnezzar has, he thinks he's obtained by his will, his choices, his power, his might, his strength. Now, the scripture shows us that anything we have comes from the sovereign hand of God. It wasn't by our might. It wasn't by our power. It wasn't by our will. The God who made heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made by human hands, nor is he worshipped by human hands as though he needed anything, for he himself gives life and breath and all things to all people. So anything a person has, it comes about by the power and the will of God. The interesting thing about this passage, when you think about the free will advocates that constantly say that God would not turn people into robots, that he would not force people. Now here's a situation of a very powerful man with very high stature who's now forced to eat grass like a beast for over seven years. And part of the reason why he's under this predicament is because he's not recognizing the sovereign hand of God. It's God who deals out to men what they have. And you see this by the following verse where Nebuchadnezzar then goes on to say, at the end of those days, when my reason returned to me, I raised my eyes towards heaven, and I blessed the Most High who lives forever and ever. For his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will among the host of heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can hold back his hand and say, What have you done? Now the free will crowd is constantly saying that God would never force people. He would never turn people into robots. They're constantly saying that would make God wicked. We see that Nebuchadnezzar's attitude after being turned into basically a beast for over seven years, eating grass off the ground. He's not calling God wicked. He's not charging God with evil. After this has happened to Nebuchadnezzar and he was on the ground eating grass like an ox for over seven years, he says about God that no one can hold back his hand and say, what have you done? That is, when it comes to the will of God, and if he wants a man to eat grass like an ox for over seven years, 
nobody can stop God, nobody can hold back his hand, and nobody can say, what have you done? In other words, nobody can say to God, you have done something wrong here. They can't charge God with any evil or any wrongdoing. For what we see here that God does according to his will among the host of heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth, that the people are accounted as nothing. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can hold back his hand and say, what have you done? See, this is another biblical story that does not fit in the free will scheme of things, who are constantly saying, the free will people are constantly saying, that God would never force people. He would never turn people into robots. God is 100% sovereign, but he's given man free will. Now think about if you sat down and had a conversation with Nebuchadnezzar after these seven years of him eating grass like an ox, like an animal. Do you think that Nebuchadnezzar would have the same free will mindset that the people that hold the free will today? Do you think Nebuchadnezzar would say that God would never force anybody? He would never turn anybody to a robot. And people that say that, that God would never make robots, think they have a lot more control than they actually do. Their body is a biochemical machine they have no control over. Every heartbeat, every breath they take. And thousands of functions that are operating in the body that a person has no will or control over. But they're functioning and operating by the design and the will of God. So the people that say that God would never make robots, when you consider your body, it's a biochemical machine. There's thousands of functions operating by which you have no control over. You've been placed in this body that's subject to different limitations and the particular body that you're in, you did not get a choice over. I believe it's the modern conveniences that give people the illusion of free will, something that people didn't have in the past in terms of entertainment, fast food, ATMs. A person can get in their car and quickly drive across town, get in a different location very quickly, gives people the illusion of free will. Say when you're going out to eat, you got all these choices between choosing all these different restaurants, places you can eat, gives people the illusion of free will. Choices do not demonstrate free will, folks. Choices are not independent from causation or influence. You turn on the TV, you got over a thousand channels to switch around to watch this or that, find different entertainment things to watch, gives people the illusion of free will. Having the choice to watch Simpsons over watching a Greg Jackson video isn't free will, folks. See, if you place yourself in the mindset of someone 2,000 years ago where they didn't have a car, where they could quickly get to a hospital because there was no hospital, there was no TV and entertainment, there was no Twitter or no Twitch, because of a lack of modern conveniences, people felt very restricted and confined and subjected to the life and reality they were in, which they did not get to choose in the first place. Think about many of the people 2,000 years ago, if they were able to view our existence today. Do you think they would maybe choose to switch places? Be able to have an air conditioner and heat, and plenty of food to choose from, clean water, hospitals, education, all these modern conveniences with the choices that go with it that give you the idea that there's free will it gives you the impression and the illusion that free will is happening when choices do not demonstrate free will at all and that's one of the huge problems is a lot of people that are very new to the subject and think that choices demonstrate free will but choices are not independent from causation or influence of a person's nature by which choices come about for example, I could place a pail of peanuts in front of an elephant, and I could also place a huge pile of steak next to the elephant, so that the elephant has a choice between eating each of these items. Now, the elephant will always make a choice according to its own nature, according to its own will, according to its own desires. A choice has been presented to the elephant, but the elephant will always choose something according to its own nature. And so when we talk about the nature of man, where it says there's none righteous, no, not even one, there's none who understand, and there's none who seek after God. 
when it comes to the nature of man, there's none who seek after God. There's none who make a choice to seek after the one true God. So you can put the choice of the gospel out in front of the natural man, but the scripture says the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, and neither can they understand them because they're spiritually discerned. See, putting the gospel out in front of the natural man is like putting a bunch of stakes in front of an elephant. They're not going to want it. It's foolishness to them. They choose things according to their own nature, and an elephant does not want a bunch of raw meat, and a natural man does not want the gospel, which is a spiritual message. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and he cannot understand them, because they're spiritually discerned. In other words, you have to be born again. You have to have the Spirit to be able to make this choice for the gospel. In other words, you have to be born again. You have to be regenerate. There has to be a disposition of the will by which one would accept and understand the gospel. See, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, to us who are being saved. It is the power of God. See how the gospel says the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. Well, this is the natural man. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. So you notice the inability in this passage that they cannot understand them. Can a elephant understand algebra? Can you explain algebra to an elephant where they can understand it? No, because of their nature. And it doesn't matter if I place a hundred math teachers in front of that elephant and give that elephant a choice to choose one of those math teachers to teach them math. The elephant cannot learn math. It has the inability to learn it because of its nature, because of its disposition. And that is the way of the natural man. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto them. And he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. So this is why Jesus says a man must be born again. It's a necessity. You have to be born of the Spirit to receive spiritual things. But when a person is born again, it's not by their own choice. It's not by their own will. Those who are born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, nor of bloodline, but they were born of God. See, when the scripture is using this language to be born again, we understand that being born is not something that we had a choice over. It wasn't something that our will was involved in because our will wasn't around and we weren't able to make choices because we did not exist yet. So when we were born into physical reality, we know that other people's will were involved. We know that other people made some choices. And then we came into being, and this is how we see the scripture talking about how we are born again. Those who are born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, nor of bloodline, but they were born of God. They were not born of the will of man. People make choices out of their own will. So what the scripture is saying is you didn't choose to be born again. You didn't will to be born again. It was the will of God. You were born of God. When it came to being born physically, was your will involved? Did you get to choose that? Absolutely not. And this is the language that the Bible is giving us on how we are born of God. Those who were born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, nor bloodline, but they were born of God. Using this language of being born and paralleling it to natural at birth, to being born naturally. So the spirit is like the wind. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it's coming or where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. When you're walking around outside, do you choose to let the wind blow on you or does the wind blow where it wishes? The first time in your life and reality when the wind blew on you, when the wind came upon you, the first time in your life and reality, was your free will involved in that? Did you get to choose that situation? Or does the wind blow where it wishes? Do people have free will over the wind, or does the wind blow where it wishes? Jesus compares the spirit to the wind, and he says, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it's coming or where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. 
So Jesus compares the spirit to the wind. The wind is an irresistible, unavoidable force. No one has free will over the wind. The wind blows where it wishes. And so when the spirit of God makes someone born again, it's like the wind blowing upon them. The spirit goes where it wishes. It makes alive whom he wills. And so when we have now access all the things that pertain to the kingdom of God, when it comes to God's righteousness, sanctification, redemption, the wisdom of God, when it has to do with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, who would have the arrogance to say that all the things that pertain to the kingdom of God they have achieved by their own hand? That by their own will and by their own choices, they have brought about the kingdom of God. See, we have received a far greater kingdom than Nebuchadnezzar had in his lifetime. We have a far greater kingdom. Now, the people that hold to free will believe that they receive that kingdom by their will, by their power, by their choices. And you can see Nebuchadnezzar having the same attitude the king spoke and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for my honor and my majesty? See, Nebuchadnezzar believes he has this great kingdom because of his own will, because of his own choices. Is it not by the might of my power? And then it says that while the word was still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven that said, O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And for a time he lost the kingdom for over seven years, as he was turned likened unto an animal, eating grass on the ground like an ox, so that he would be shown by God that the same God that raised him up to be a king is the same God that lowered him down to be like an, an animal. So Nebuchadnezzar woke up to an understanding that day of who's in charge, who's in control, and how things work according to the counsel of God's will and not man's. And that people have what they have because God has given it to them, and people are where they are because God has placed them there. And people don't get to decide who they will be. God made them to be who they are. So at the end of those seven years, when Nebuchadnezzar came out of his state of insanity, where he was crawling around on the grass like a beast, which in free will terminology would be a robot, that God made this person like a robot for over, you know, that God forced this person for over seven years. At the end of those days, Nebuchadnezzar lifted his eyes towards heaven when his understanding returned to him. And he said, I bless the Most High who lives forever and ever. For his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are as counted as nothing, but he does according to his will among the host of the heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can hold back his hand and say, what have you done? See, when your reason returns to you like Nebuchadnezzar's did, you'll understand that no one can hold back God's hand. That is, nobody can stop God and what he's going to will to do. And no one can say, what have you done? In other words, no one can charge God with any wrong. Nobody can bring God into account. And when your reason returns to you like Nebuchadnezzar's did, you'll understand that he does according to his will among the host of heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth from generation to generation. When a person's reason returns to them, they'll realize that God is sovereign over the inhabitants of heaven and earth that the people are counted as nothing and God does according to his will. In other words, when your sanity returns to you, you'll realize that free will is a lie. So God bless you, brothers and sisters. Peace to you. Take care. And I hope your night or day is going good. God bless.